Hello everybody, Yuri is here. Welcome to the video on the introduction to survival analysis and Kaplan-Meier curves. Can there be something more horrifying than a Titanic crash with lots of immediate death? Well, unfortunately, yes, namely not immediate death. Imagine survived people in the middle of the cold dark ocean, some of them in life jackets, some without clinging on ship remains with a huge panic and little hope for rescue. There will be no helicopter to save them, it's 1912. There might not be a single ship in those waters for months. How long will they survive? Will time simply prolong their suffering or increase the probability of survival because eventually they will be found by some random ship? Do women have higher chances of survival than men? What about rich versus pure passengers? Well, in this post, we'll find answers to all of these questions and along the way, we'll learn how survival analysis works. Particularly, we will understand why and when we need survival analysis. We'll learn about the most important concepts of survival analysis, like survival curve, censoring and lock rank test, will manually calculate, then compute, and then interpret survival course. And finally, we will compare survival between two or more groups, for example, females versus males. Well, why do we need survival analysis? The short answer is for data like this. What is this data? We have only two columns, time and days, and status. So let's observe only 10 people during the 10 days after Titanic crash. And in this column, we see day number one, day number two, etc., until day number 10. And in the next column, we see status of people where one means dead and zero means missing. It's neither dead nor survived. So how do we analyze this data? My first intention was to use the numeric variable time in the linear regression to model the survival time for two different status groups, zeros and ones. But when I modeled it and plotted model results, I realized that something isn't quite right there. All the information we have to model the survival time are zeros and ones. And the average time of dying is about two and a half days. It misses a lot of information. For instance, half of the people, namely three persons, died on the very first day. And the further we go in time, the less people die, which we can see from this table below. So, average is kind of useless and dying is not really linear. That's why we need a probability of dying on every day. And since I was thinking about probability of dying on every day, I immediately thought about using this binomial um, variable status with zeros and ones in logistic regression to get a nonlinear probabilities of dying for every day. And as I modeled the results, they looked promising. So we could catch the nonlinear trend of probabilities, we could calculate the probabilities for every day, but the only problem which still remains and which is a key problem here is that we only can model probabilities of dying, but our zeros are still not survivors. Thus, we overestimate survival probability if we use logistic regression and model zeros as survived and ones as not survived. Again, while linear regression describes time, it misses a non-linear survival probability. And while logistic regression catches a non-linear trend beautifully, it overestimates survival probability because it uses zero as survived. So we can't analyze survival data with, with classic methods. And that is exactly why we need a survival analysis method which models a nonlinear survival probabilities over time while accounting for those subjects of the study which are either dead nor survived. And thus, survival ana analysis solves both problems. Good examples for survival analysis would be cancer studies in medicine, 
or first car failure in the engineering, which sometimes called failure time analysis. So you see survival analysis investigates the time to particular outcome of interest. And this outcome of interest could be bad, like in our case of Titanic crash, its death, it could be failure of the car or remission to relapse of some sickness. However, the outcome of interest could also be good, for example, recovery from sickness or discharge from the hospital. So, point in time of reaching that outcome is generally called event. And this is the most important part of this time analysis. Survival analysis is also a generic term because it is not only about survival. The event is needed because only if some patients survive cancer or only if some cars don't break by a certain time or by a certain event, we can answer valuable questions. For instance, what is the time from the start of the treatment to recovery? Is it half a year? Is it one year? What is the probability of sur to survive cancer after exactly one year? This can be important because if I know that my probability of survival in the second year is very low, I will spend my first year very, very differently. The last example would be groups comparison. For example, we could check the survival time of smokers versus non-smokers. But what if the patient withdrew from the study or a car got stolen one day before the event? Remember our missing observations? What if the people in our Titanic experiment got missed before 10 days? What do we do? Well, we have to censor them. And what the hell is censoring? I'm glad you asked. Censoring is a pretty strange word to apply to a person, right? But you're all already familiar with the concept of censoring. Think about dictators, which can censor books for <laughs> inappropriate political information, or some TV shows which censor inappropriate language. And you can probably see that inappropriate is a key word here. So since we don't know whether the missing person will survive or not, it's totally inappropriate to make any conclusion about the survival status of this person. So we censor this person. Important here is that the censored observations still provide useful information. Um, they survived from the very start of the study until the day we lost them. That is why we need to include them into analysis. Another important moment here is that we need to exclude them from the analysis as soon as we know that their status is missing. Otherwise, they will still count as zeros or as survived and we will again overestimate survival probability. So there are lots of ways to do subject of the study. For example, for no reason, the subject just disappeared due to another event because the person has died of the lung cancer during it was um, in the middle of the ocean uh, after a Titanic crash. They feel so good that they don't show up. It's often the case with people. Or they feel so bad that they just give up. It's often the case with animals where the hosts of these animals just don't see any uh, hope anymore. So I think it's enough theory for the beginning and let's get down to business and calculate the survival curve or Kaplan-Meier curve manually, step by step. He we still have our 10 days and 10 people. And imagine the peaceful sunny day right before the Titanic crash. No one has died, but all 10 people are at high risk of death. They just don't know it yet. Guess how many people would probably die the day before the crash? The answer is probably zero. I mean, literally, the probability of dying is zero. Because we know the crash will not happen the day before the actual crash, yes? To answer this question more properly, we need to remember the definition of probabilities. Probabilities are ratios of something happening to everything what could happen. That is why if nobody out of 10 people died the day before the crash, the probability of dying is 
while the probability of surviving is 100%. Then, at the day of the crash, where all 10 people are now know they are at higher risk of dying in the beginning of the day, and the end of the day, three of them have actually died. So the probability of dying at the first day is then 3 to 10 or 30%. And the probability of surviving is 7 to 10 or 70%. The second day is a little bit more interesting because one person has died and one simply disappeared. This lost person was most likely carried away by the waves and hopefully was rescued. The hope is big because the further people are scattered in the ocean, the higher the chances are that one of them will be found alive. And this one person will let the world know that others uh, are still alive. So, despite the fact that missing person seems bad, it might turn out to be a good thing. So, we certainly cannot count a missing person as dead. But since we are not sure whether this person is still alive, we can't say the person survived. This produces a dilemma. Despite not being dead, this person is not part of the experiment anymore. And we have to remove it from the number of people at risk. So while the second day would have seven people at risk, since three people have died at the first day, the third day would be left with only five people because one person died and one disappeared, was censored as compared to the day two. Similarly to the first day, the survival probability is cumulative and always includes the probability of the day before. Wait a second, let's stop here. Why should we include the probability of the day before? I like to think about the cumulative probabilities in terms of hunger. When I'm actually alive at the third day, I'm getting more and more hungry and have less and less strength. So my survival status is very clear, survived. But I am not as vital as the day before, so that the probability of survival decreases every day and we have to catch this decrease by taking the probability of survival of the previous day into account. That is why we multiply former probability of survival by the current probability of survival. At the end of day three, one person has died. And the next two days, two persons have disappeared. So we'd censor them. And there is no need to calculate something for sensor data, because we don't know whether they survived or not. And since we are interested in either survival or death, the final table contains only dead cases. At day 6, nobody died or disappeared, so that is why we do not calculate anything for that day either. The last person in our experiment died at the day 7. So the number of people died will be 1 and 2 were censored. Thus, the full manually calculated table will look like this. So we have 6 people died and 4 were censored. But what happens if we ignore censoring and simply calculate the probability of being not dead? If we ignore censoring, censored observation would be treated at, as survivors, and the probability of survival, for example for day 7, would be 40%, which is almost twice as high as compared to the actual probability of 0.24, which accounts for censoring. Thus, we'll massively overestimate the survival probability. I know I repeated it several times, but it's important, that's why bear with me. So the survival probability is conditional because the person needs to have survived, this is the condition, beyond a certain time. But then censored observation need to be taken out of the further calculations. Otherwise it leads to survival bias, and there is a little story to it. During the Second World War, some planes came back from the battlefield with a lot of damage from bullets. They barely could fly, but they still came back. 
So the military decided to protect the aircraft with more armor at the places where the most bullet holes were, like wings, and reduce the armor at the places where no bullet holes were, for example, the cockpit or propellers. Surprisingly, the percentage of planes which came back did not increase. The engineers were puzzled until one invited mathematician, Abraham Wald, which were actually invited to solve this problem mathematically, said, put more armor on places with no bullet holes because if these planes are shot, the plane won't come back. Makes sense, right? And as the others thought about it, they realized that all the planes which came back did not have any bullet holes on the cockpit or the engines. The bullet hole shows all the places where aircraft can be shot but still come back or survive. That is the survivorship bias. So it seems to me that logistic regression has a survivorship bias as compared to the survival analysis if we want to analyze the survival data. Now, having calculated everything manually, we can compute the survival curve in statistical software and see whether the results match. First of all, be sure you know exactly what zeros and ones in your data mean. Because in a logistic regression, ones means the survival, while in a survival analysis, one is always death. Secondly, we have to differentiate the censored cases somehow. For example, with the, we can mark them with the plus sign in the data or on the plot. This data displayed here shows that people were censored on the second, fourth, fifth and last day. You can also install and load survival package to be able to execute this code. The surf function unites time and status data into a single survival object, which allows to account for censored observations. These objects can then be used to model the survival probability by the surf fit function. We model the survival by adding tilde 1 to the object where 1 means no variables which could have influenced the survival. Thus, our survival object on the left of the tilde is then the response variable and on the right of the tilde is 1, which means predictors, and in our case 1 means nothing, no predictors. So let's produce our first survival model and have a look at the summary of the model. Surprisingly, it delivers exactly the same table we just calculated above manually. So why on earth would we even calculate everything manually if the software gives us this? Well, there are several reasons to it. First of all, you already have a good intuition about survival analysis. Secondly, a computed survival model gives you so much more, for example, the confidence intervals, which you definitely don't want to calculate manually. It's pain in the butt. And moreover, it can give you the survival on every day, not only on the day we experience event or sensor some observation. Thus, having all these probabilities, uh, we can plot these results in the form of Kaplan-Meier curve. So let's plot the Kaplan-Meier curve and interpret the hell. The x-axis represents time in days and the y-axis shows the probability of surviving or the proportion of people survived. So the curve itself shows the exact survival probability over time. A vertical drop in the curve indicates at least one event. At the first day, we have three events, that's why the drop is so high. And the height of the vertical drop shows the change in the cumulative survival probability. A horizontal part of the curve represents survival duration for the certain time interval, which is terminated by the next event and, of course, drop of the curve. The Kaplan-Meier curve looks like a strange staircase with uneven steps, where survival probability is constant between the events and is therefore a step function that changes value only at the time of each event. 
In this way, each patient contributes valuable information to the calculations for as long as it is alive. Censored people are shown exactly like in the survival object, with pluses, as you can see on the day two. However, most of the pluses look like vertical ticks since they lie on the horizontal part of the curve, for example days 4 and 5. The risk table below the plot shows the number of people at risk, which are actually all really alive people in the experiment, which did not experience the event or sensory at a particular time point. Dashed line represents the median survival time, which corresponds to the survival probability of exactly 50%. And if we ignore censoring and simply estimate the median time for only dead people, we'll get one and a half instead of three, which will increase the survival probability from 50% to almost 70%. Again, ignoring censoring will result in the overestimation of survival probability due to the survivorship bias. For your convenience, I have written down the whole information or interpretation on an extra slide, so you can pause the video and read it if needed. Survival analysis gets really interesting the moment we can compare two groups. For example, we can compare survival of males versus survival of females after the Titanic crash. And I personally differentiate four benchmarks for comparing groups. The first one would be the visual comparison of course to see whether there is some difference. Our plot shows that females have a high probability of survival almost through the whole time period. For instance, the day 50, the survival of females is approximately 75%, while the survival of males is approximately 65%. However, whether this difference is statistically significant requires a former statistical test. The second benchmark would be the comparison of confidence intervals. Overlapping confidence intervals suggest that survival of males and females is not too different and could be due to chance. Estimated median survival times reveal more than confidence intervals, particularly the time at which the survival probability is 50%. For example, the median survival of females is much higher at 87 days than males at 65 days. These 23 days of difference sound significant to me, but again, only tests can tell. And that is why the last benchmark for comparing two groups is the p-value estimated by a non-parametric long crank test which compares median survival times of groups. The null hypothesis of this test is that there is no difference in survival between two groups. The p-value of 0.011 rejects this null hypothesis and indicates a significant median difference in survival time between females and males. Again, I have written everything down for you on an extra slide, so you can pause the video and read it. Interestingly, lock rank tests can compare more than two groups and say whether there is a significant difference among these groups. However, it does not say between which groups exactly. That is why we often need an additional analysis which pairwisely compares each group to each other group. Such analysis is often called a post hoc. Um, the median survival is circa 90 days for first and second classes, 58 days for the third class and approximately 65 days for the crew, suggesting a good survival of rich people. A low p-value of 0.02 suggests a significantly different survival among the groups. So we need a um, post hoc test results and as usual we have to adjust the p-values for multiple comparisons to avoid making a false discovery or missing one discovery.
The results of the post hoc revealed that survival of the first class is significantly higher than the third class and the crew. The median survival of the second class is similar to the first, but the confidence intervals overlap a lot with other groups and that is why the second class passengers um, do not generally have significantly higher survival time despite much higher median survival time. I did not display confidence intervals here because they would overlap a lot and clutter the picture. Here you also have the interpretation written down on a single slide. So, this is the last slide in our lecture and these are the conclusions. Survival analysis studies the time it takes for an event of interest to occur. kaplan meyer plots visualize the survival while the log ramp test compares the groups. Of course, kaplan meyer curve has a lot of advantages and one of them is that it accounts for sensor data. Otherwise, we would overestimate the survival probability, which has a name of survivorship bias, and it would underestimate the hazard of death. A non-parametric nature of Kaplan-Meier results in a few assumptions. Important assumption is that censoring should be not informative. Which means, if we know why the person withdrew from the study or why the person was missing, it is already useful information and we have to include it into the model, into our analysis as an extra variable. If we have no idea why the person withdrew, we cannot analyze it. And this is the advantage of survival analysis method. It can draw the most information out of this not informative data. And of course, uh, survival analysis is not perfect, so it has a couple of disadvantages. The first one is that Kaplan-Meier curve is actually not a curve at all. It can describe survival in a smooth function by a few parameters, like a slope. That's why Kaplan-Meier is non-parametric. Kaplan-Meier method can't model numeric variables, but unfortunately only categorical. The last one is that Kaplan-Meier method can't include many explanatory variables. I think you saw that um, even if we have several categories, we always have one explanatory variables, be they uh, sex, women and men, or ticket class, first, second, third ticket class. Due to this disadvantage, it may miss the effect on other factors, which could potentially affect the survival. So, if you ask what next, next would be models which can really eliminate or solve these problems and two of them are exponential um, parametric models and Cox proportional hazard models, which I plan to do a video on. So, if you found any value in this video at all, please consider subscribing and pressing the like button. And as always, thanks for learning.